All right. So you notice there we uh, started off in Philippians chapter 4. It's our Bible memory passage, verses 4 through 8. And uh, we're we'll starting off there in verse number 8. Of course, the last verse that we're supposed to be memorizing this week here. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. And what I'll be preaching about tonight is actually, the title of my sermon is called Biblical Meditation. And what you're meditating on is what you're thinking about, what you're spending your time thinking about. And we see right here in Philippians chapter 4, verse number 8, all these various things that we ought to be thinking about. We need, you know, your thought life is very difficult to take control over. It, this is probably one of the hardest areas to control is, is what's going on inside of your head, right? Controlling your actions sometimes can be difficult, but it's a lot easier to not go through with something that maybe might already be going on in your head. But where, what's going on in your head is going to lead to action eventually. So we need to make sure that what we're doing, you know, what we're thinking about are the good things, are the right things, so that we don't uh, allow ourselves to get into any more sin. Because even, you know, even thoughts can be sin. You know, we're thinking about bad things. You're thinking about, you know, thinking about adulteries and fornication. You're thinking about, you know, whatever, or, you know, anything. Anything that's a sin in, in actuality, when you're thinking about these things and kind of allowing yourself to, to play it out in your head, that's a sin also. We need, we need to realize that and recognize that, that we don't want to be caught getting into that. So, you, know, you don't want to get into this playground in your head, if you will, and, and kind of tamper with sin and, and, and see how far you can take things just in your head and just say, oh, well, it's just in my head. It's not that big. Well, you know, what? God knows every single one of your thoughts. And we need to remember that because I can't read any of your thoughts right now. I have no idea what's going on in your head, and I don't want to know, okay? <laughs> I don't want to know anybody's thoughts. But you know who does know? God knows. And you might, you could sit there and think, my wife doesn't know what's going on in my head. My kids don't know what's going on in my head. And you think you're just getting away with just kind of reveling in whatever sinful thoughts you might want to allow to play out in your head. But stop and think for a second. God knows every single thing that's going on in my head right now. So the next time you want to go down that path of thinking, wow, how would it, what would it be like to go off and do whatever, right? And you start playing these things out in your head. Remember that God sees everything that's going on there. And, um, and you know, you are held accountable even for your thought life. And now, is it, is it as bad as committing a sin? No. But it's still a sin. It's still important. The Bible says the thought of foolishness is sin. If just the thought of foolishness is sin, I mean, think about how many other thoughts you can have that are way worse than just maybe a stupid thought or a foolish type of a thought that, that can be, you know, it's even more of a sin for that. Now, how are we going to take care of this? Well, we need to be filling our mind and make sure our mind is occupied with the right things. When you do it, the Bible says in Proverbs 16, 3, commit thy works unto the Lord and thy thoughts shall be established. So one of the first things you can do is say, I'm going to commit my works to the Lord. So how I spend my time is going to be spent doing things that God approves of, doing things that are in the will of God. When you're out, think about it this way, anyone who's gone out soul winning, how often are you out knocking on people's doors and going soul winning and then just thinking about getting drunk and thinking about just like anything, maybe, you know, things you shouldn't be thinking about? It's not happening. I mean, if you're walking in the spirit, if you're doing what God has for you to do, these other worldly pleasures and, and worldly things and these sins of the world, they're, they're not entering into your mind. Why? Because you're committing your works unto the Lord, like the Bible says, and the Bible's true, commit your works unto the Lord and your thoughts shall be established. What you're doing is what you're going to be thinking about. And the more you can keep yourself doing the right thing, the thoughts will follow through on the right path. The, when you get in a problem is when you find yourself with nothing to do. That's one of the biggest times you have a problem is when you wake up, it's Saturday, I don't got to go to work, I don't have anything planned for today, I don't know what to do. 
and you've got all this idle time, oh, what should I do now? And, and then your mind can just go off and go free and, and whatever. You know, you, you want to keep yourself busy, keep yourself scheduled, keep your time planned out so that you don't run into that type of an event. Now, the Bible gives us there in Philippians 4, verse 8, many things that we ought to be thinking about. He tells us, think on these things. Think about the things that are true, right? The truth. We love the truth. We're a word of truth Baptist church. We love the truth. We love God's word is the truth. We got to think about the things that are true. Let's think about things that are honest. As opposed to, you know, we read all through the book of Proverbs, we did our Proverbs Bible study of the wicked person who's always trying to cheat, trying to steal, you know, trying to be mischievous and, and defraud people. We need to be thinking exact opposite, thinking about things that are honest, thinking about things that are just, what's right, you know, what, what is right in the sight of God, what things are pure. And I love that word pure, purity. It's such the exact opposite of the filth of sin. You know, pure is free from filth. Pure is something that, that, is, that is nice, that's good. It's, you, know, you think of children and their innocence and their, you know, and their purity. Those are good things to think about as opposed to the, to the wickedness and the filth of this world. Think about whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report. And if there be any virtue, anything that's good to do, just in general, virtuous thing, if there be any praise, think on these things. Now turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter number 4. 1 Timothy chapter number 4. Girls, be quiet and stop moving around. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Philippians 4a is a great list. Hopefully you're memorizing that list and keeping that in your heart to remember, hey, I ought to be thinking about these things. I ought to be thinking about pure things. I ought to be thinking about good things. That verse alone will help you. You know, you should try to trigger yourself to think about that verse when some wicked thought comes into your mind. Train yourself. It, if nothing else, if you haven't decided what you're going to do for the challenge for this month, this is a great one. It goes right hand in hand with our memory verse. You can memorize this verse and say, you know what? For the entire month of April, I'm going to catch myself every time a wicked thought comes into my mind. I'm going to quote this verse. I'm going to have this verse pop up and this is going to help me get right back on track. And I'm going to think about the things that are good. And all, while you're at it, memorize Proverbs 16.3. That's, that's what I quoted just a minute ago. Commit thy works unto the Lord and thy thoughts shall be established. Both of those will help you to get back on track in your thought life and to make you not get, get too far off into, into a sinful mindset in, in the, the, the comfort of your own mind. You're in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Look at verse number 13. Sarah, be quiet. Verse number 13. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Now, this is advice. This is not just advice, but this is instruction given from the Apostle Paul to Timothy, who was an elder. He was a, he was a, a pastor of a church. And um, even though this is instruction given to someone like that, all of these instructions, I've mentioned this before, they're good. Well, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. The instruction that's given to the pastor also applies to everybody else in the congregation when it comes to these types of things, when it comes to, you know, the qualifications for even being a pastor. Hey, it's good for everybody to meet those qualifications. It's good to have all of those good attributes. It's good for us to give ourselves wholly to. So he says, meditate on these things in verse 15. The context is, till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. Reading God's word exhorting people and just having good doctrine, studying, knowing the Bible, having a good form of doctrine. And he says, meditate on those things. Think about these things. Be, be, have that continually be on your mind. Give yourself wholly to them. This is something that's good for all of us to do. This isn't, you know, it's not just for a pastor to do. We should all be doing this, right? But definitely the pastor should be meditating on these things. But the pastor is the one teaching the doctrine. But do you want to have false doctrine? No. Nobody should. I mean, we, we want to have the right doctrine. So give yourself to these things. 
give attendance to reading, think about the doctrine, and meditate. I meditate means you're doing some serious thinking about these things. Now, the world has their own version of meditation, and I'm just going to touch on this kind of briefly. Because the meditation that you find in Scripture is not the same as the meditation that the world is going to present to you. Right. And I touched on this briefly in my sermon on Hinduism. Because Hinduism has a big emphasis on meditation as a, their religious practice. This is something that is part of their religion that they do. And they, they spread that religion to the world through things like yoga. Which yoga is Hindu. It has Hindu origins, and, and, you know, and don't deceive yourself into thinking yoga is just fine. It's not. It it's, it's directly comes from the Hindu religion. And what goes along with that is the meditation. And um, the meditation that they do, like I said, it's completely different than what the Bible is referring to when it's talking about meditate, meditate on these things. Uh, most of the war, and there's, there's a slight variations, you know, between just something that's not quite Hindu, but it's meditation, and you know, and there's, there's all different religions, and, and people have their own spin on, on various forms of meditation. So I'm not going to go necessarily in depth into any particular one, but generally speaking, what they're a guide to is they're basically like self-help tools, and they're focused on getting your own awareness. And specifically in the, in the Hindu religion, it's, it's you trying to discover yourself and, and get this self-awareness and this consciousness of who you are and, and turning yourself inward to find out who you really are and, and, and to, to bring that out. And basically what it is, it's to discover your heart. Uh, turn if you would to Proverbs 18. We see what the Bible says about that, about, you know, just trying to see what's in your heart, trying to discover yourself. The Bible says in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Amen. So if we want to get to your own heart, that's not where we should be looking for, for the, the source of enlightenment, right? Like the, like the Hindu religion teaches, oh, you want to be enlightened like these, these yogi masters that, that are that are, you know, teaching this false religion and, and looking inward into their heart to, to find their own consciousness and, and to achieve their enlightenment. Proverbs 18, look at verse number one. The Bible reads, Through desire a man, having separated himself, seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. A fool hath no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. The fool is the one that, that lets their heart discover itself and just say, well, I'm just going to figure out what it is that, that I want, what my heart wants. And what it, what is ultimately what that's referring to is their flesh. What's in my heart? What's in my fleshly heart? See, we need to train our heart to do what's right. Sarah, sit still. We need to train our hearts to know what's right and to seek the truth and to seek God and God's wisdom and God's enlightenment. We need to, to, to be able to, to be renewed in our mind and be renewed in our spirit to do that which is right because we were born with a sinful nature. We were born with a wicked heart. And if we just give ourselves over unto what's in our heart, the end result's not going to be good because the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it according to Scripture? But that's what the Hindus and that's what the world's going to teach you is... is when their, their version of meditation is to clear your mind and think about nothing so that you can, you, you can let what's in your heart come out and you could just realize whatever it is that, that whatever wicked thing is going to come to mind. Remember what the Bible said about committing your works unto the Lord for your thoughts to be established? They're just trying to say, well, clear your mind of all thoughts and then whatever comes out of that, you know, is, is what's right. But see, that's not what's right. That's not what's true. We have the truth, and, that's, and this is what we need to be filling our minds with, not nothing. Another thing that's related to meditation in this world is hypnosis. Now, we all know what hypnosis is in general, right? But I found a pretty good uh, resource of, of an explanation or, or kind of like a definition of hypnosis. 
And when you really think about this, and I'm going to read this out loud for you, you really see how wicked this is. And hopefully you're not getting involved in this stuff. There's a lot of people that try to, to push this. I know even with, um, with the home birthing and stuff, there's hypnobirthing is one of the things that they teach and they try to get people to be a part of. And they say that, uh, that will help alleviate your pain and stuff like that. Don't get involved in this stuff. This, is, this, is, this goes into that form of the world's type of meditation and these practices where um, it's not from God. I'm going to read this for you. And, and, I, and when I was looking at this, I was just like blown away. Anyone with any type of biblical wisdom, it just jumps right out at you. So they say hypnosis is a trance state characterized by extreme suggestibility. Suggestibility meaning that you're open to having suggestions planted into your head, right? That you're just, you're just wide open to just someone else being able to, to give you whatever type of suggestions they want to have. Extreme suggestibility, relaxation, and heightened imagination. So if you want the imaginations of your own heart being heightened, that's what hypnosis does. It says, in this special mental state, people feel uninhibited and relaxed. Now, do you think it's a good thing or a bad thing to be inhibited when it comes to what's inside of your heart? You ought, probably ought to have some inhibitions on acting out on just whatever is coming out of your heart. But this puts you into a state where you're uninhibited. You know what else puts you into a state where you're uninhibited? Alcohol. Getting drunk. And is that a good thing? Is that something that the Bible says, yeah, go ahead, get drunk so you'll be more uninhibited and you can just do whatever it is that's coming to your heart and, and act the fool? Of course not. But hypnosis, it's a special mental state where people feel uninhibited and relaxed. Presumably this is because they tune out the worries and doubts that normally keep their actions in check. In this state, you are also highly suggestible. That is, when the hypnotist tells you to do something, you'll probably embrace the idea completely. So when you get into this trance state, that this world teaches, Sarah, I'm not going to tell you again. When you get into this trance, trance state, you are highly suggestible, and it says you'll probably embrace the idea completely of whatever is told to you. So a hypnotist is, is he's hypnotizing you, and he's getting your mind into a position to where whatever they tell you is going to be, yeah, that sounds good. I'm going I'm to embrace that idea completely. And it says, this is what makes stage hypnotist shows so entertaining. So this is when, you know, when you see the people getting hypnotized up on stage and they start acting like complete idiots and walking around and doing these, these crazy things. And everyone laughs because they just look like fools up there on the stage. It says, normally reserved, sensible adults are suddenly walking around the stage clucking like chi chickens or singing at the top of their lungs. And this isn't just some fraud. This is real. This stuff really, I mean, people really do this stuff and they fall into these hypnotic states and, and are doing those things. And people would never do that stuff. Does that sound like a godly thing to allow yourself to be put into a state of mind? To allow someone else to put you in a state of mind where you're just open to whatever, so whatever they want to tell you, you're going to be real likely to embrace that. Whatever they tell you to do, oh, I'm not very inhibited. I'll just go and make a fool of myself. I'll just say and do stupid things in front of a big group of people. And of course not. That's not what God wants for us to do at all. <clears throat> and don't be playing around and tampering with this stuff. It's, it's definitely not godly. Now turn if you would to Acts chapter 10. Because I want to cover this also. What, what happens with hypnosis is they do put you into a trance state. But what's special about hypnosis is that even in this definition, it says it's characterized by extreme suggestibility. It's, it's a particular state where they're hypnotizing you to, to open you up to these certain things. Now, there are a few times in the Bible where people do fall into a trance. And that's not a bad thing. But the difference between the trances that happen in the Bible where a couple of men of God fall into a trance, it's where they get a vision from God. And it's not some, out, some other person exerting control over them and putting them into that frame of mind. 
And, it, and what happens in the Bible is that it comes through prayer and not from somebody else, you know, putting you into this trance-like state. It, it, I would say it's a more of an artificial way of doing it with someone exerting more control over you as opposed to the way that it happens in Scripture. And, and just the way that they're completely different and the way that people would fall into a trance in the Bible versus the way that a hypnotist uses it, you can see that it's not the same exact state of mind that you're in, even though it's called a trance. So a trance is where you're just really completely focused and like you call it like in the zone, right? I mean, when you're in this, this trance-like state, you're not always highly suggestible. I could get it, you know, you could get into a trance sometimes even at work. Like when I get into work and I'm writing code and, and, and I just like, boom, I'm, I'm wrapped up completely in the work that I'm doing and everything else around me, just not paying attention to it at all. And you could completely get into the zone. Now, that doesn't mean that if someone were to come up to me and tell me to, to act like a chicken, I'm going to do it, Right? There's a big difference in the state of mind when you're under hypnosis versus just being in a trance that's, that's not like that, okay? So when you come across these, and, and what people might try to do, and that's why I'm bringing this up so you're aware of this, so that someone doesn't try to deceive you and get you involved in hypnosis and say, well, the Bible has people in trances. Well, the Bible has meditation. Well, the Bible has this. We're covering that tonight so you can see this is biblical meditation. This is a biblical trance, and it's completely different than what the world's pushing through their hypnosis, through their trances, through everything else that they're trying to push. It's not the same thing. Acts chapter 10, verse number 9. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. So Peter's pray. He goes up to on top of the house, gets himself alone, no distractions. He's going to dedicate some time in prayer unto God. Verse number 10. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. So he's hungry. It's lunchtime. And he's just like, well, I'm just going to go up on the roof and I'm going to pray. They're still getting food ready and stuff. And he gets so wrapped up in his prayer and he's really focused and he's really just set on praying to God that he's actually falling into a trance now because he's just, I mean, he is just really focused and intent on praying. And verse 11 says, And saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet and it had four corners and let down here. So that's when he sees his vision of, of all the, you know, the, the, the creatures and God saying, Rise, Peter, slay and eat. Right, and, he's, and, and that whole thing. We're not going to go into the actual vision itself. doesn't matter. But this is what he was doing. He's praying, and then he falls into a trance. Next chapter, chapter 11, he recounts what happened to him. He's explaining that because he's explaining the vision. He's explaining to people that ultimately it's good. You know, it's okay for them to go unto the Gentiles and preach the gospel unto them and do everything else because of this vision that he had. Acts 11, verse number 4, the Bible reads, But Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning, and expounded it by order unto them, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. And then he goes on to explain it. So we say there again, it's repeated. I'm praying, and then I got into this trance. Flip over, if you would, to chapter 22 in the book of Acts. Chapter 22. And we're going to look at verse number 17. We're going to see one more example of of um, someone falling into a trance. And this only happens a few times in the whole Bible that, we're, that it's mentioned like this. So we're looking at them uh, right now. And you'll see this is not talking about them being hypnotized by somebody. This is, this is a different type of trance. Verse number 17, And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. And saw him saying unto me, make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. This was the Apostle Paul. And he's talking about he was praying. So we notice they're praying. They're praying unto God. And that's when they fall into a trance. They're focused. They're, they're really trying to pray hard unto God. And they fall into a trance. Now, one thing that's also, turn if you would to Matthew chapter 6, important to note here is that they're not chanting some prayer to God to fall into this trance, right? The, the, the Hindus will tell you, oh, you need to 
chant this mantra over and over and over and over and over again to meditate and then you could fall into this trance and you could open up whatever's in your heart and all their other nonsense. That is not what these people are doing when they're praying to God. Let's be very clear about that. There's no way that they're just repeating a prayer over and over and over and over and over again in order to fall into these trances. Matthew chapter 6 is very clear how Jesus taught them how to pray. And in verse number 7, he says, But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions. So they're not saying, you know, Oh, Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, the King of you and just, and just saying they're our fathers over and over and over and over and over and over again until they fall into a trance. That's stupid. It's vain. It's useless. There's no point in just repeating some empty words and not just praying unto God. We don't need to have vain repetitions. It says in verse 7, but when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. That's what the heathen do. That's what the Hindus do. Amen. They're heathen. That's what they do. You don't do that. It says, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. You don't need to just repeat yourself over and over and over and over and over and over again just to be like the, like the, the child in, in the back of the car going, are we there yet? 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 Look, I heard you the first time, <laughs> right? We don't, God doesn't want to hear that either. He doesn't want us praying to him with some vain repetitions over and over again. Peter knew that and Paul knew that. They're not just trying to get into these trances. They fell into a trance. It just happened to them because they were so intent on what they were doing. They're so focused and dedicated saying, I'm going to pray. And they're praying fervently. We saw the, the, the prayer of a, of a righteous man, the fervent prayer of a righteous, a righteous man availeth much. They're praying and really involved in their praying and, and, they're, and they're laboring in their prayers to God. And then they fall into these trances because they're not being distracted. They're completely, you know, separated and focused on what they're doing. Totally different type of trance than what we see out in the world today. So don't let them confuse you on this. And say, oh, people in the Bible are in a trance. Oh, people in the Bible meditated. It's different. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 5. Now, prayer and meditation go hand in hand when you're earnestly praying because you are so focused. You're not getting distracted by anything. And meditation really in the Bible is just thinking deeply or reflecting and pondering, right? You're, you're really thinking about these things when you're meditating, that word meditation. We're going to see a, a bunch of examples of meditating in the Bible. Psalm 5, verse 1, the Bible reads, Give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my meditation. He follows that up with, hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for unto thee will I pray. So we see oftentimes you're meditating and you're praying to God kind of go hand in hand. The things that you're thinking about, you know, you're spending a lot of time pondering and you're praying unto God about those things as well. Now, what should we be meditating on? You know, the, the Hindus are going to tell you just, just chant some empty word over and over again. Or, and usually, you know what, their words, honestly, their words aren't even all empty. Many of those words have meanings with their Hindu gods and goddesses that you just don't know because you don't, you don't speak their language at all. But that's what a lot of them you're doing and you don't even realize it when you, when you chant those mantras over and over again. You're chanting them to devils. So what's going on? Turn if you go to Psalm 63. We're going uh, to spend the rest of the evening in Psalms. So we ought to be meditating. Let's look now. I'm going to spend, spend the rest of the time in a sermon focusing on what we should be meditating on. I gave you the warning about the, what the world's trying to tell you meditation is and, and, and hypnosis and trances and all this other stuff. And it's wicked. We shouldn't get involved with that stuff. But what should we be meditating on? Because the Bible talks about meditating multiple times. It's, it's found all throughout Scripture. And we're going to look at many of those times. Sarah, be quiet and sit still. Psalm 63, verse number 5. One of the things we should be meditating on is, is on God himself. Psalm 63, 5. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips when I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches. So he's talking about meditating on God. Meditating on his power, on his glory, on all the good things that God does for us. 
How much time do you spend just thinking about God? Just having God in your thoughts and you're meditating on him. You're thinking about him. That's something that we ought to be doing. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 77. Psalm 77. We want God at the forefront of our thoughts and, and to spend time thinking about God and keeping him in our mind and not pushing him out of our mind. Psalm 77, verse 11 Bob reads, I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy wonders of old. I will meditate also of thy work and talk of thy doings. When you're spending time meditating on the works of God and all the great things that God does and his power and all that he's done, when that's in your head, you're going to start talking about that stuff. I mean, it's going to come out because that's what you're thinking about. I mean, whatever it is you think about time, I think about time I spend with my wife, whatever it is that's going on in my head, I'm a lot more likely to talk to my wife about it or talk to my kids about it. And you ought to be having some times where you're thinking about the Lord and thinking about his words and thinking about that, you know, wasn't it, you know, isn't it great that God, you know, led the children of Israel out and, and performed all these miracles and did all these great works? I mean, it, think about those things. Just, just have it. You see, you already know that. Yeah. But think about them and meditate on them and keep it fresh in your mind about how awesome God really is. Amen. And keep them at the, at the forefront of your mind. Um, turn, if you would, to Psalm 1. I'm going to read from Psalm 143, verse 5. It says, I remember the days of old. I meditate on all thy works. I muse on the work of thy hands. So again, just talking about meditating on the works of the Lord. Um, but more often than not, what we see meditation on in Scripture more than anything else, is meditating in God's law. Meditating on the law of the Lord. Joshua 1.8 says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. And what's really interesting about this is the world's going to tell you, you know, meditate and it's going to bring you success, right? You're going you're to be better. You're going to be less stressed. And that's true if you follow the Bible's meditation techniques. Because if you're following the Bible's meditation, you'll be meditating on the law of the Lord. You'll be meditating on the things that God said to do or not to do. And it says right here in Joshua 1.8, then you'll have good success then you're going to know the good from the evil. When you're meditating on God's word, you're meditating on God's law. He says, thou shalt do this, thou shalt not do that. That's in your mind. You're meditating, you're thinking about it. You're applying it to your everyday situations. You're going to, to be very successful in life. And when I say successful, though, I'm not talking about the world's idea of success. I'm not talking about being a millionaire and just having a bunch of money and fame and fortune. I'm talking about having treasures in heaven. Sarah? Go in the office right now. Sit down in the office. I'm talking about real success. You're in Psalm 1. Look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The person who's meditating in the law of the Lord, the person who loves and delights in the law of the Lord, it says, whatsoever he, do, he does is going to prosper. Whatever you're doing, you're going to have good success. Now, isn't it interesting and isn't it funny how so many people want to say, oh, why, you fundamental Baptist, you're so legalistic. Don't you know that we're free from the law? Well, the Bible is extolling how good it is to meditate in the law of the Lord. And you know, in the New Testament, it says we're supposed to sing unto one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And you know what this is? Psalm, Psalm 1 that we're supposed to be singing and learning and, and you know, teaching each other and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. This is teaching for us today, yes, in the New Testament, that we should be meditating and focusing on and loving and delighting in the law of the Lord. Hey, I think the law of the Lord's great. Amen. 
Converting the soul. Amen. God's law keeps me from getting into a lot of stupid things and stupid sins and getting into bondage that is on the outside, on the surface, it appears, oh, yeah, this is a great thing. It's a trap, right? Sin is just one big trap. Try to lure you into something that once you get there, you realize how empty it is. I was speaking with, um, with Paul before, uh, after service this morning, and we were talking about almost the same exact thing where it's just like, you know, I live the life of, of whatever kind of felt good to do it and, and getting involved in the, the alcohol and the drugs and the fornication and all this other stuff. And it just leaves you empty. It's vanity. It's, it's worthless. You have that little bit of pleasure for a season for a real small amount of time. Yeah, you're having all this fun. You're acting like a fool. You're acting like an idiot. You're enjoying yourself. But you know what happens the next day and the next week? That hole, that void grows bigger and bigger. It's emptiness. It is vanity and it's worthlessness. And then you start looking back on your life and I, and I look back on my life and I spent almost a, about a decade of just wasted, stupid, sinful time and just never get that time back again. Nothing productive, nothing good done. Had I been meditating on the law of the Lord, I would have avoided a lot of, of problems, a lot of, of, of hard, heartaches, a lot of hardship that goes along with sin. Praise God for his law. He's, he gave it to us to look out for us so that we could live a good life, a great life, a fulfilling life, a joyful life. It's not grievous. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. My commandments are not grievous. Turn if you would to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Longest psalm, great psalm. Psalm 119 talks all about the law of the Lord. You want, you want to look at a psalm that's about the law of the Lord? Psalm 119 in almost every single verse is talking about, in, in one way or another, a synonym of God's law. Awesome psalm. Just extolling God's, God's law and God's word. And, and we're going to see multiple places here that talk about meditating in God's law. It will bring you success. Psalm 119, look at verse number 15. I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. God's precepts are his laws. Remember, uh, I think it's in Jeremiah, the precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little, we're learning God's word, learning good doctrine. It's his precepts. His precepts are part of his words and it's part of his laws. So we're meditating in God's precepts and having respect unto his ways. Verse number 23, princes also did sit and speak against me, but thy servant did meditate in thy statutes. Thy testimonies also are my delight and my counselors. So he's about princes, people that are in rule, right? People who are, who are ruling or reigning over them. They spake against me, is what, the, is what the psalm is saying. He says, but you know what I did? Your servant, God, you know what I did? I meditated in your statutes. He said, I don't care if the ruler of the land is in disagreement with me on what's right and on what's just and on what is you know, good uh, statutes to live by. He's making up these rules, but you know what I'm doing? I'm just focusing on your rules, God. I care about what you have to say more than what this prince has to say as far as him speaking against me because I'm adhering your law. Verse number 47 here, Psalm 119, 47. And I will delight myself in thy commandments. It's a good thing. It's a delight. In thy commandments, which I have loved, my hands also will I lift up unto thy commandments, which I have loved, and I will meditate in thy statutes. Again, another reference to just meditating in God's laws, God's statutes. I love them. I want to know them. I want them to be in my heart. I want them to guide me and instruct me every day of my life. So I'm going to meditate on God's law day and night. Psalm, uh, verse number 78 in Psalm 119, verse 78. Let the proud be ashamed. For they dealt perversely with me without a cause, but I will meditate in thy precepts. And then again in verse 148. 
Mine eyes prevent the night watches that I might meditate in thy word. The night watches, he's talking about staying up real late in order to have the time to make the time to meditate in God's word. That is putting a heavy importance on being able to get God's word in your heart and to meditate on it that, you know what, I'm going to stay up late to do this. I'm going to forsake some sleep that I could meditate on your word. The examples we see in the Bible, and of course Jesus being the number one example, we see people who lived, breathed, slept God's word. The Bible, and, and that was everything to them. Would to God that, that all of God's people would, would be prophets that would, that would have this type of an attitude, right? It's not just for the apostles. It's not the attitude just for a pastor. It's for everybody. We should all love God enough and, and care about his precepts and his laws enough to... to want to meditate on them, think about them, take the time to, to just devote, and not just in passing, not just a random fleeting thought here or there, or I'm really busy doing all this other stuff, but I mean, he's talking about stopping, taking a break, just like Peter did, to take a break from everything and just to go and pray, and this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray fervently and make sure I'm not getting distracted with anything else so that I can just devote this time unto, unto praying unto God. Turn, if you would, to verse number 97. We're going to do that last. I'm going to read for you from Deuteronomy 17. Go ahead and just stay in Psalm 119. We're almost done. I'm going to close up um, a little bit earlier tonight. In Deuteronomy 17, there's a lot of the rules of what the king was supposed to do, the king of Israel. So part of the, the Mosaic laws, you know, they weren't supposed to have a king, but if you do and when you do, because God already knew what they were going to do, when you have a king, these are the rules that he's supposed to follow. This is the way that you choose the king. This is what he's supposed to do. One of the things that the king was supposed to do was to write his own Bible and read from it every single day. I'll read it for you. Deuteronomy 17, 18, the Bible reads, And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. So he's supposed to go get a copy of the law and write his own copy. He goes straight to the source, go to the Levites, go to the priests, get a, get a copy so that you, you'll make a copy of what they have for yourself. Verse 19 says, And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them, that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren, and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. Now, you say, but I'm not a king, and I'm never going to be a king. Well, that's not necessarily true. We are kings and priests, according to God, and we're going to rule and reign with Jesus Christ when he comes back. He's made us kings and priests. But even besides that, as I mentioned earlier, you know, just because you're reading the books of, of First and Second Timothy or Titus, you say, well, these are for the pastors. No, it applies to you too. Why wouldn't you want, I mean, what, what in this should only solely be for the king? Why wouldn't, if it's a good thing for him to do, isn't it a good thing for you to do? Wouldn't it be a good thing for you to write down your own copy of the Bible? and read therein every single day so you can know what right from wrong, so that you can have proper judgment. You may not have the judgment uh, uh, responsibility that a king has, but we all make judgments in our life. You're making judgments for your children. You're making judgments for yourself. Let's make right judgments. And when you're reading the word of God, when it's in your heart, when you're meditating on these things, You'll make the right judgments. You'll know right from wrong. It'll keep you humble because it'll keep you having the fear of the Lord. And it'll keep you from getting lifted up. All good things. This is what we all should want and desire to have. And, and, and God gives us a formula on how to do it. It's so easy to forget things. It's so easy to let them slip out. There's, there's a constant battle for, for what is going to be inside of our mind. Satan is fighting. The world has its agenda of trying to, to, to cram your mind full of wickedness and sin and everything that's not God. And the Bible's explaining to us, no, 
Think on me. Think on God. Think about my ways. Think about my laws, and you'll have good success. Last place we're going to look at, Psalm 119. We're starting verse 97. You notice Psalm 119 has every, it's basically every letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's, it's kind of subdivided. And um, this one is Mem. And what's interesting about that is this is because this is all about meditating on God's word. And a good way to remember this is, you know, think of memorize with Mem. Um, it's, a, it's a good psalm for you to, to memorize and to see the importance of meditating and memorizing God's word. Look at verse number 97, Psalm 119, starting in verse 97, the Bible reads, Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Thou through thy commandments hast made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. And let's just stop right there. Having a love for God's law, it's a lot easier to commit things to memory and to want to meditate on these things when you already love it, right? People who, who love sports. I love football. I love basketball. It's not a chore and it's not hard for them to memorize stats and to know all the players and to know their histories and where they went to college and everything else, right? It's fun for them. Why? Because they love it. I mean, they love the sport. They love all this stuff. That might come more naturally, but we need to, again, be working in ourselves to change our attitudes to realize what precious value is in God's word and to see it for what it really is and hold it in such a high regard and high esteem that we love God's word. And we don't just say we love it, but we honestly love God's word in our heart. When you can work on your mind and on your heart to love these things and love these words, doing the memorization, doing the meditation in God's word, it won't seem like a chore. It won't be that difficult. You'll know this is actually really good. I love this. I'm thinking about this all the time. And we see here now the benefits it says, through thy commandments, you've made me wiser than mine enemies. You know, we're living a Christian life, you're going to have a lot of enemies, but when you've got God's wisdom, you're going to overcome any of your enemies. I mean, there's, there's no way that someone's going to outsmart you when you've got God's wisdom. It's, you know, this reminds me of, of Stephen. When, when Stephen was stoned in the book of Acts, he was preaching that sermon unto the Jews and they, they couldn't handle it. They had to stop their ears, literally, and just like little kids. And no, 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 I don't want to hear that anymore. And they ran on him because they couldn't, they couldn't uh, overcome his wisdom. He just, I mean, what he was saying was just true. And they knew it and there's nothing they could do about it. Now, they hated the truth, but they couldn't stop it. They couldn't resist the wisdom of Stephen. He ended up being martyred. And you say, well, that doesn't sound like a very good ending. But you know what? It really is. For Stephen, was it enjoyable to go through that at the time? Probably not. You don't want to be getting rocks you know, thrown at your head, and, and I'm sure it hurts quite a bit. But when you get to heaven, and you get a chance to talk to Stephen, and you see what position he is, whatever he's got, whatever God has rewarded him with, as a result of his faithfulness to death and allowing himself to be martyred and staying true to the end. And, and, and so much that that, that story is in the scripture. It's in the everlasting word. I think it's a small price to pay for what, for what he has. Being made wiser than his enemies. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 99. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. This is showing you truly how powerful and how much wisdom is in God's word. He's talking about the ancients. He's talking about his teacher. He's talking about all these various people that supposedly have all this knowledge, right? The knowledge of the world. And you think there is some value to, to the knowledge that this world offers. And, and, you know, we continue to build off of knowledge of previous generations, right? There, there's knowledge that just gets accumulated. There's knowledge in technology. There's knowledge in, in all these various areas. But he's saying, I understand more than all those ancients. Why? 
because he's studying and meditating on God's word. And that's ultimately what's the most important anyways. That's what matters the most. How quickly you can, you can churn out a bunch of, of widgets or gadgets, does it really matter? No. What matters are souls. What matters is, is God's word and, and doing what's right here. You know, what is life all about? What is life all about? Is it about how successful your business can be and, and how much, how many things you could produce and how many, you know, being able to, to speak with someone across the world on a cell phone? Is it cool? Sure, it's cool. Is there anything wrong with it? No, but I mean, is that what life's about? Is just trying to get more of that type of technology? Doesn't matter. It's all going to be burned up. Every last bit of it. Your house, your boat, your car, whatever you got, it's all going to be burned up. It's going to mean nothing. People matter. Let's keep reading here. We're almost done. Verse 101, I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. I have not departed from thy judgments, for thou hast taught me. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore I hate every false way. Meditating on God's laws, memorizing God's word, keeping it in your heart, keeping it in your mind on a regular day-to-day -day basis is going to guide you through your entire life. It's going to, to keep you from the evil way. That's why he says, I've refrained my feet from every evil way. I didn't go that way. Why? Because I've been meditating on your words. Your words are sweet. I haven't departed from your judgments. Why? Because you taught me. Because I learned from your words. And he says, through thy precepts I get understanding. That's why I hate every false way. When you open up the door and you have a soft spot for sin and the, soft, and, and the wrong ways and, and getting up, you know, you're a lot more likely to follow down that path. But when you hate it, you say, I don't want to have anything to do with it, you're a lot less likely to, to stumble and fall in that manner. You know, the Bible says flee fornication. You know, well, it doesn't say cozy right up next to fornication and get as close as you possibly can to fornication, but just don't do it. You start getting that close, there's only one small step you get into that sin. But when you're fleeing it, I mean, you're turning and booking and running the opposite direction. I don't have nothing to do with it. I want that far away from me. Meditating on God's word, loving his laws and keeping it in your heart is going to maintain that proper attitude within you. You see sin for what it really is when you're focused on God's word all the time and not allowing the junk and crap from this world in to, to soften sin and to normalize sin and to desensitize you to sin. Spend your time in this book. Redeem your time this month and redeem it exchange the sinful habits and the, the sinful use of time with, with meditating in God's word. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your instruction, for your words, dear God. I pray that you would please help us all to, to have hearts that actually honestly love your words, that want to put your words into practice every day, dear God. Give us the wisdom. Give us knowledge, Lord. You've already promised to... Uh, to give us knowledge. In the book of James, you promise us that, that you'll, um, you'll give unto us liberally if we just ask you, dear God. And I'm asking for more knowledge and for more wisdom that we can just apply this to our lives and, and to um, be wiser than our enemies, dear Lord. And I pray that you please help us to, to have our spirits stirred up, to make the time to meditate on your words and to, to keep them in our heart, Lord. Help us, especially... You know, there's a lot of us here, I believe, that, that aren't very good at, at memorizing, Lord. Help us to overcome that. Help us to just plug through and to get it down and that uh, we would dedicate enough time to it to know because we know how important it is to have your words in our heart, dear God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.